To begin, I would like to actually just uh, uh, invite uh, um, the host um, for uh, this fireside chat, Arun Rath. Arun Rath is a reporter with uh, Frontline and the World WGBH, uh, Public Bro Broadcasting Service. And uh, he has written and produced a number of uh, uh, documentaries, Arun, such as Rules of Engagement. He's been associated with NPR's Talk of the Nation, and also been um, responsible for collaboration between various uh, uh, entities in the uh, radio marketplace, NPR, PRI, BBC, etc., and uh, is known for his investigative journalism. So it gives me great pleasure to uh, invite, uh, have uh, uh, Arun Rath uh, uh, be the host for uh, uh, this uh, fireside chat. And next, I would like to uh, uh, invite uh, our uh, fireside chat uh, keynote uh, speaker, Sanjay Mehrotra. As many of you already know, that Sanjay is uh, uh, the co-founder of SanDisk. So how many of you have uh, uh, owned SanDisk uh, devices at any point of time? OK? Quite obviously, because SanDisk ships almost a billion devices per year. OK? So it touches in the entire globe. And he co-founded uh, SanDisk in 1988. And uh, we're going to learn how uh, it all happened. And currently, he's the president uh, CEO of SanDisk. And uh, uh, he holds uh, uh, many honors and many accomplishments. He has uh, uh, studied at Bits Pilani. How many Bits Pilani people are here? OK, great. You're proud of him? OK, great. He went to uh, uh, UC Berkeley subsequently and also studied at Stanford. And uh, uh, besides all these things, it's really special for me to, uh, um, on a personal note, mention that uh, I first met Sanjay uh, as a teenager, many decades back. And uh, he came to our school in New Delhi, high school soon, uh, and soon became uh, part of our well-established clique. And we did have an elite clique, OK? We have another member here, right here, you know, of that clique, Bridge. So Sanjay was a very good boy, a bit shy, but very hardworking and super well organized. All, I was always envious of him, you know. For some time, you know, he sat next to me as well. So apart from that, I discovered that, you know, a bit mischievous, but generally reliable, OK? So in New Delhi, there is an archaeological monument called Lodi Garden. Some of us knew its nooks and crannies well, because that's where we hung out. These are 13th century uh, uh, ruins, but, and somewhat considered haunted and spooky, especially for you know, kids at that time. So once Sanjay was visiting our uh, gang at our hangout den in Lodi Gardens, and we decided to test his courage. And that was at night. So he was given a candle, and he was supposed to carry that candle to the top of this haunted monument. There were several floors to it, OK? And he was supposed to, once he reached the top, he was supposed to wave that candle. You remember? And once he reached the top. So he took the challenge on. And once he went in, he vanished into the darkness for a long time. So we waited and waited, and after a while, you know, we panicked. We said, wow. So we decided to send a rescue team to fetch him. But by the time they could get in, actually, we just suddenly saw, you know, the candle from the top. And uh, so that was, you know, his, uh, the initiation right to enter our gang. He said, all right. He deserves to be, you know, one of us. So his courageous journey started way before SanDisk. So at that time, he was a risk taker. And even today, he remains one. So with that, over to you, Arun and Sanjay.
really excited to, uh, to talk to you. Um, one thing that, that struck me in, in that video, just from my own profession, was that photographer talking about how uh, the technology, uh, this sort of memory story, was a game changer for his profession. And it's not just photography, it's, it's so many things. I, I think of when I can go out in the field and, and in my hand hold a recorder that I could record on for several days worth of material, professional level quality audio. When you were starting up the company, uh, all those years ago now, did you have a sense of how big things were going to be, how much of a game changer this might be? So actually today is uh, Sandesk 24th birthday, so it's quite a coincidence. Happy birthday! Uh, so it's uh, an honor for me to be here in front of you all on Sandesk 24th birthday. And yes, 24 years ago when we started, we knew that we had a technology that had tremendous potential because we were, as you heard in the video, all three of us, Eli Haradi, our lead founder, the lead visionary for the company, Jack Yuan, uh, who was a uh, process technologist, and myself, uh, a design, memory design engineer. The three of us knew that what we were working on in terms of the flash memory technology had tremendous potential for the future. But we just did not know that this would become as good, really. And uh, I mean, I used to tell my wife uh, several, many years ago that when the company becomes a billion dollar company, I will retire. And I thought that that would be very, very far away, but we actually achieved that in 2003. So we never imagined that the markets will be will become this big. And what was, take us back to 1988, what was the, the ecosystem like at, at, at that time? What was the tipping point that, when did Eli call you, how did, how did you get things going? So, um, this 1988, uh, Ellie had the concept for, as I mentioned, flash memory technology, so uh, he called me and Jack. So, by the way, I would like to note that this was three immigrants. Eli Harari, an immigrant from Israel, Jack Yuan, immigrant from China, and of course me from India. So it was three immigrants who started Sandus. <laughs> and uh, frankly, it didn't take me long at all. I mean, uh, because I worked with Eli earlier, I knew him, knew of his reputation. Uh, he called me, we discussed uh, his ideas at the time, and I immediately committed. There was no money. That, that was there at that time. We didn't really have funding yet. But, um, it, and similarly, Jack, uh, who was a process technologist, he too had worked with Ellie earlier. What were you doing at that time? I was, at that time, a company called Integrated Device Technology, uh, where, I was, uh, where I was a design engineering manager. But you say it wasn't a difficult decision for you, but still you were in a stable position, right? A comfortable job. And this is, again, a, a leap that you're taking. Correct? You know, certainly, but um, I was there in Silicon Valley, right? And in that time frame in Silicon Valley, there was definitely uh, several semiconductor companies that were starting at the time. Today, you don't see that many semiconductor startups uh, because of the investments that it takes uh, to get semiconductor companies going. But at that time, I mean, this was uh, commonly done, and in fact, uh, two years out after finishing my master's at Berkeley, I mean, immediately after finishing my master's at Berkeley, I was uh, at Intel as a design engineer. And um, I, I had uh, the fortune to work for one of the best uh, designers that was there in the industry at that time in the area of non-volatile memories. And uh, he was considered the golden boy of uh, semiconductor memory industry for non-volatile. So I had the fortune to work with him and he taught me a lot and in more than a year, after I was there, slightly more than a year, he left to start another company. So that was my first exposure and I was learning so fast from him that I too wanted to join him. So actually, in, uh, soon after, within a year, I left Intel and joined a startup that he had started called Seek Technology at that time, S-E-E-Q, which eventually got acquired by Lucid Logic. So I had already the startup bug uh, from Intel. I left in a couple of years working at Seek. So 
concept of joining a startup or taking a risk uh, was really no, no issue for me. But what motivates you in, in, in that way, do you think? Uh, you know, my f family background from India, my dad always really encouraged us to uh, take risks. He took many, many risks in his life. That's why for me, it, this was really, startup was uh, taking a risk. I mean, never considered it as an issue because I'd seen my dad taking many risks, uh, you know, when we were growing up. And uh, so it, I think that was part of our culture growing up. And I just want to tell you a story, picking up on uh, Shekhar's story here. Uh, he uh, told you about how he made me go up with the candle you know, of the tomb there in Lodi Gardens. So when we were little kids, uh, I was raised in Kanpur. Um, when we were little kids, kids uh, my dad, we lived in a very big four-story house in a joint family. And um, so it's a four-story house at night, all lights out. My dad used to make us, make not us, all the kids in the joint family, he used to make us go from the bottom floor, all lights off in the, stairs, go all the way to the top, shout from the roof, so, so that Nietzsche in the Angan, you know, he would be there. One kid after another would go up in the joint family to shout from there because he wanted to take the fear out, fear of the dark from the little kids, okay? So this is, so for me, at that time, it was no big deal. You gave me a candle. <laughs> he didn't even give a candle when he used to go up the stairs. Yes. Yes. So, uh, you know, definitely, uh, and he also, my dad and, you know, my family, I mean, focus very much on education and learning, just like I'm sure everybody here has gone through that. With entrepreneurship, obviously, there, there are two important sides to it. There, there's the, the thinking up, coming up with the ideas, but also executing them well. And it's, your trajectory is very interesting because, obviously, you started off, you were an engineer, you were an idea person, a, a person of, of science and innovation, but now, now you do run the company. And, and I'm, I'm wondering, it's, it's an awful big span to talk about, but can you talk about that trajectory, how you got from that one place to the other? Actually, a very interesting point you made there regarding execution, and I think that is extremely important. Uh, many people have good ideas, uh, but you really have to stay with it and you have to execute. And one of the values that we articulate at SanDisk is execute and exceed. And this is something from day one at SanDisk we very much focused on. That while we drove innovation, while we drove technology to the cutting edge, uh, we made sure that uh, we don't just talk of ideas, we really translate them into success, into execution. So, and that requires tremendous attention to detail. You have to really manage all aspects to make sure that a technology idea or a product idea or whatever business idea is truly can be taken and become a success in the marketplace. So I think execution is very important and this is one place where I see that sometimes entrepreneurs uh, get simply carried away with the big idea and don't focus enough on the execution and they keep moving from one idea to the next and in the process leave behind. Uh, something incomplete and that, that does not lead to uh, success. I have a question about uh, control of the company. I mean, you were certainly funded by VCs with the FAB facility and all that. You needed a lot of money. So did you have issues keeping control of the company because you wanted to make sure you follow your vision, your execution and all that? And, and how would you see times have changed if they have? So um, the company uh, from day one was partly funded by uh, VCs and partly funded, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in the initial round by AT&T and Western Digital because they were our technology and uh, product partners. So that was the combination. And uh, SanDisk uh, over the years always leveraged partnerships. I mean, and I would say, I mean, to those uh, wannabe entrepreneurs or other successful entrepreneurs, I would definitely say that Partnerships is absolutely key because there is, you cannot do everything on your own. If you try, life is too short. So finding the right partners and, uh, you know, partnership that is win-win, you can't just try to win yourself. Partnership where you can understand the other partner and compromise if you have to, but lead to a win-win is important. This is where, for example, uh, creating our initial film 
making it an open standard rather than keeping it only for Sanders was important and I believe that made it big. I just want to share another story with you that uh, Kodak at um, one time said that they will use our film if we made it exclusive. That means give the technology and the product all exclusive to Kodak. And we decided, and we were you know, a little company, I mean this is early 90s, I mean we were no one, right? We decided that we don't want to make our solution exclusive to anybody. We want it to be an open standard. We want everybody to be able to uh, use it. And because we did that, yes, it got competitive. Um, more players were making it, you know, and yes, that helped bring prices down as well. But that's what made the market bigger as well. And today I am sure Kodak wishes that they had not uh, approached it from that point of view at that time. Uh, but going back to the VCs and control, uh, I have to tell you that we did not frankly care about the control part of the company. We were focused on build and you know whether right or wrong, you know, and I'm sure in certain situations it's the right approach and other situations maybe not so right. Uh, we were really focused on uh, taking a technology from an idea to huge market and we uh, knew and here I would give uh, total credit to Ellie, you know, who was the lead founder of the company in terms of uh, really not worrying about these things and always making sure that the company is well funded so that you can take risks which are very important for a startup and stay the course, you know, follow your vision and passion and that means if, you know, a certain share of the company is gone to others, it's okay because you have to keep the big picture in mind, you know, rather than just achieving, uh, getting a small uh, part of the pie, if you look for the big pie and if you have a smaller portion of it, it's okay. So we did not really focus on that aspect. And then what, what has changed in, in the last 24 years in terms of those challenges for entrepreneurs? I'm sorry, uh, challenges? What, what, what has changed in terms of the challenges for entrepreneurs in the last 24 years? I think, uh, in, I mean, times are great. I mean, as good as any time, in my opinion, for entrepreneurship. Uh, certainly, in certain areas, it's more challenging for entrepreneurs than in other areas. Uh, you know, these days, uh, social networking or, uh, you know, solutions that are unique to certain consumer preferences, uh, those kind of things have an easier time uh, getting funded. Uh, things like semiconductor or hardware is more challenging in terms of uh, getting the funding. Uh, but I believe that, you know, the principles, if you have a good idea, you have a good team, you're thinking out of the box and you have some track record of demonstrating that you can execute and make things happen, not just think out of the box, but make it happen too. If you have that, you have good people and you demonstrate belief and, you know, a decent business plan, I, I don't think things have changed, you can still get funded. We have time for, for one more question. Last question. Last question, thank you. Um, I, uh, Sanjay, thank you for coming. It's a great talk. Um, I have a question, or actually, you know, do you have any advice for uh, younger or first-time entrepreneurs? You know, we have really from high school students all the way to uh, fresh college graduates or grad students, uh, you know, starting out. So, I'm more interested in, like, there are a lot, of, a lot of us actually who probably did not come from like a risk taking family, you know, nine to five things and first generation of you know, just work. Uh, you know, it's tricky, you know, based on whether your family come from the business background or not. So do you have any advice for like those younger or like, the first time entrepreneurs who are waiting to jump in? You know, absolutely. From my own experience, what I can say is that um, as I mentioned earlier, that, you know, think out of the box, uh, but be committed to make it happen too. So commitment, uh, staying with something, even in face of adversity, uh, extremely important. Uh, focus uh, and passion. I mean, don't try to do a startup just for the heck of doing a startup. I mean, you must truly have passion. You must feel it in your gut. You must have the fire that what you are really talking about is something that can make a difference because if you have it, 
then even if you have adversity, you can handle it, you can get over it. So I think focus, passion, conviction, and then um, you know, listen to others and adapt if you have to. Um, I think adaptability and speed and definitely global thinking is extremely, extremely important. And uh, I just want to share with you again a couple of examples here, and I know I may be running late, but since I had the opportunity, I just want to emphasize this adaptability and agility. I think these are extremely important because any business, uh, if you are really looking for long term, things are dynamic. As I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, ideas and categories come about that people never imagined, just like, you know, until 2010, nobody really imagined that tablets will start becoming this big. So you have to be able to adapt your business. And in case of SanDisk, we started with the idea that we will be selling to the OEMs. And uh, we, while we were working with digital imaging companies, we, digital imaging in early 90s was still not big. The cameras didn't have good enough resolution. Internet was not big to make sharing the pictures that easy. So, it was really not taking off. So we were actually struggling as a company. But we believed in continuing to push the technology. We, we at that time worked with Go, EO, worked with, uh, you know, uh, we were designed into ThinkPad, IBM ThinkPad, uh, the Grid Pad, Newton, uh, you know, the Apple Newton. We were designed into all of these with our flash solutions. And uh, pen computing, it, it was a big buzzword at the time. It was a big flop. So as we were approaching mid-90s, the company really was in a deep chasm because imaging was not taking off, pen computing was not really taking off, technology was there, but we believed in it. And then we said, okay, as internet started taking off, imaging started becoming bigger, we realized that to really make the company bigger, we should start getting into retail. So we did not start a retail brand. I mean, we didn't. I mean, none of us came with retail branding experience. Late 90s, we started to get into retail. And we saw the opportunity that as the cameras would become bigger, people would want to buy imaging cards in the retail, not just rely on what comes inside the box with the camera. And we started retail. So we adapted the business. We were all an OEM company, and then we became a retail brand, went to retail. So this is an example of how you must adapt. You cannot keep just thinking that what you are doing is the right thing. And uh, then came 2001. A, a company really had a 40% reduction in revenue. We had to lay off 40% of the people. Uh, and it was a very tough time. So if you really have to pursue, for my advice for young entrepreneurs is stay tough, be prepared that yes, there will be a lot of adversity and you have to fight through it and emerge stronger through that uh, you know, adversity. And I know that these are all common words, but uh, you know, when you're running a business, these situations do arise. And as entrepreneurs, as leaders, you absolutely have to demonstrate that, you have to believe in it. You have to come through it because that's when successfully your entire team will come along with you on the other side of the chasm as well and you know will take you to greener pastures together as a team. It's marvelous. Thank you for the great questions. Sandy, thank you so much. Thank you.